I will read a number of poems today in honor of my family in New Orleans. I have actually a cousin who lives in the Ninth Ward, and I recently went to visit him, and he showed me a, quote, gift from Katrina, which was a gigantic watermelon. The watermelon was full of poisonous, toxic water. And I've always thought about this as being, in some sense, an apt metaphor for the ways in which the country responded to that ordeal. It was a horrific thing to happen to people, and this nation handled it in a way which suggested both that the people did not matter, and I'm talking about the people of New Orleans, New Orleans right? But that everything that we took as being sacred was in some sense not taken into account. So the poems I read today, I want to read to suggest, first of all, how important and dear everyone in New Orleans is to me and to this country and to the world, and to celebrate both the great jazz that comes from that part of the country, those incredibly resilient people who continue to make us wonder at what human beings are able to do and to survive and to triumph over, and to again my, remind us of what is really essential and sacred about the Afro-American tradition, which is one of saying yes to life when it seems absolutely impossible. So this is for all of those survivors who have taught us how mighty we can be in the face of the most calamitous thing imaginable. And may we continue to teach people what is really, truly essential about human beings. And also, may we always be mindful of the fact that no one ever got here on his or her own, that all of us, in some sense, have to remain witnesses for each other. That's the greatest act of faith and love and celebration. And this is my small attempt, very small attempt, to repay a community that has given me and so many others, so much. To hear the river for Langston Hughes. I should also say that Langston was someone I knew as a kid. He's actually responsible for me becoming a poet. To the, to the chagrin, I think, of some members of my family who hoped I'd get a real job. But anyway, here's the poem. To hear, to hear, to hear the strong black song, to hear it, to hear the river, is to know its ways, to know the gaunt thin source which somehow like hues becomes long black water, becomes so that much might come after it, a handhold, a griot. And so long black song comes dark, provident, absolute. And finally coming to the river, facing the dogs and white men, Facing what is lost and possible, we hear the river, we hear the river, we hear the river. My heart goes to New Orleans and to Common Ground Relief for working to rebuild the city and hopefully so much more than that. Bad medicine. No one waits for this, it comes. Amid the dumpsters in the parking lot, this stinks sprayed across the like, blistered paint. Power lines reflected on the half-frozen puddles cut the clouds to diamonds, and ducks step through the motor parts and grass, nibbling at mud. Every part of this world lives, I think, and then you come stumbling from your house looking guilty as always of something someone says you did, but you don't know past the gas station shut by blue laws along the creek, not pausing to check out your face in the water, not looking at the shopping cart or the plastic bag caught in the bush jerking in the wind. Down the sidewalk in your practice stagger and long leather coat you go, looking for frozen waffles and a milkshake to tide you over when you stop to light a cigarette, lips and skin like paper, and lean your head against a telephone pole to gently heave in the street.
humanism, humanism, noun, a strong concern for human welfare, values, and dignity. Politicians play it up. Actors award each other. Academicians rake it. Corporations sponsor and commercialize it. Everyone puts on their own spin. We are always ready to give what we can afford, not what we can't. When it is at one's expense and not one's gain, things change quickly. Who, me? Nism? The next poem has a very odd title. 1619 to 1979 is a large time. It is a large time, but the important date there, obviously, is 1619, when the first black people came to the shores and they didn't come on a luxury liner. One. When we came here, we knew it would not be easy. Our language looked for a star, a galaxy, something to give us a dim penetration. When we understood, many of us lost ourselves, too. This morning was a blue morning. Not a thing seemed rich or outlandish. My spirit dry as a man inched up with heroin. This morning, I thought, I might never leave here. Three, I count the blues. I count each and every one of them. Children ask me what I recall, remember. I remember their mother's bellies. I remember how small grew those ships which brought us here. Four, I count the blues. I count each and every one of them. Five. Here, our children meet death as one might the sun. When we understood, many of us lost ourselves. Six. Children ask me what I recall, remember. I leave from a boat, move to a great land, and wander a newer forest. Seven. The blue shall set you free. The blue shall set you free. The blue shall set you free. But I've been here so long. Luther eating bones. He snaps at flies and goes back to grinding the bone between his paws. It is cleansed of meat and marrow, and now the flies are at it. Eventually, he craps it out. After that, who knows? Rain will wash it into the gutter. For a long time, that was what we died of. And still today, it's true that cow shit breaks the sky. But we always die of each other and have drained all the music out of shit. This long catastrophe of such deep heritage and place and thought betrothed now to the heart. I'd like to read this poem that uh, kind of put me on the map many years ago. It's called The Practical Poet. And this I'd like to dedicate to uh, the late, great Archie Ammons, Henry Charles Bukowski, Jr., and um, whoever else is out there listening. It's called The Practical Poet. I guess I drank a little too much last night, started flushing poems down my toilet. I'm now prepared to heed the advice of my teachers, my critics, my plumber. Even he said, maybe you ought to give up this shit. I said, drinking? He said, no, you better keep drinking. Well, I was in treatment at St. Mary's with John Berryman, and they told us to stop. 
what happened? Oh, I'm still writing poetry. It's my real weakness. Well, I don't like coming out on Sundays either. I said, don't worry. I'm a very practical poet. I'll think of something. Thank you. Oh, this is called The Day at the Races. I don't think it's about horses or the Marx Brothers or any of that. At night, they disappear between the stars, swallowed up by abysses lit with street lights and the dim orange fog of skies into flag-draped coffins or meteor showers of voices washing over the Republic. The laughter goes on, prolonged for hours. By day, they reappear. The others fade to gray, submerged in the brightness or stretched like an old, overused cloth, a band of dirty horizon. Emergence, then, of night. Negatives leap to life, and I, hideous, glowing, spectral, am stalked by the death-defying reality of shoeshine men who harpolate with long, incoherent snaps of the cloth, tales of rock soup prepared over open fires and burning plantations in Haiti. They, melted down by the boreal fires from the ink in my pen and gelled, become a black egg in a white frying pan. The yolks bubble and sizzle like eyes crackling in the oil, burnt toast with a pat of butter, harvest moon on a windless night, hopes hanging from ropes in the trees, torrential minstrelsy of sudden rain disturbing the wind chimes. One man acting alone. One man acting alone, sitting, squandering time, sneering at death. He lets the clock run down a few minutes before saying how precious time is, how every moment represents a lifetime somewhere. Split seconds produce perpetual outcomes. Many times, when the end is near, in the space of a heartbeat, new planets are born. But he can't stop it, can't fathom eternity eternally. So he lets the clock run down a few more minutes and fills the beautiful space with nothing. I've always wished that I was a horn player. Um, I think most writers wished they were musicians. So this is as close as I can get. And I'm reading it very mindful that this is centered on people who probably know more about the music that has in some sense created this great country than anywhere else on this planet. So this is for jazz and New Orleans, and also, of course, for Sonny Stitt, the glowworm. The glowworm works up the barren limb like a fragile index of the world. This is not his poem. He sings for himself. The poem here is the singing of the glowworm, how he struggles up the next section of bark, stretching like an accordion his mind seething with his body's thumbless design. But this is not his poem. It is about lovers. It is about sound and sense and sound sense. Innocence, incense, innocence. It is about games and lovers. It is about the struggle to be perfect, to make that love inviolable sacred. It is about the poet who needs language, who needs the world, who needs words to love him. It is about love, vast love, love of meanings love. It is about the soul which speaks beyond sense, which flushes like a quail after a startling. It is about love, the love of the smallest darting, the imperfect journey, the glow, glowing glowworm, worthy of itself and worthy then of singing.
And this last one is called The Stopped Voices Go On Speaking. The breezes had lost meadows and found truck tires blasting smoke at the sky. Flesh drifting seaward, a scarf of purple and orange dissolving on the tongue and eye. A ruined taste in the mouth of old bricks and dead plaster. The ash of burnt clothes and posters. Limestone lintel on the ground. The lion stretched above the head, hierotic and calm, now grovels. Their feet pound the ten-cent beehive tombs of god kings. Even firebugs in the street have faces of hammered gold, blushing in the turning lights and the cat ache of sirens.